So I was able to use Cursor AI to take this PR with 950 file changes, there's 2,200 diffs, and recreate a new PR with over a thousand changes in it, 412 files. And this was all with the power of simple automation scripts and Cursor AI. In this video, we're going to use Cursor AI to bulk update thousands of changes across hundreds of files within an existing PR. The way we'll do this is by generating dozens of prompts ready for use by Cursor AI. And what those prompts will do is change thousands of lines of code across hundreds of files, and they'll all be put together using a programming construct called Clueless that I'm designing at the moment. And this is one of the first previews of how I see it working. So stick to the end and we'll streamline the ability to use Cursor AI. I've been seeing a lot of articles and questions lately on bulk code creation using different tools. So people are using ChatGPT, other people are using Cursor and Ada. And the situation I found myself in recently was that I was helping a company move from Ruby 2 to Ruby 3 and they had 900 odd files that needed changing, but there was a problem that needed to be dealt with en masse. So when the PR was being reviewed, there were hundreds of files. And one of the things that was noticed was that there was a new stylistic change, which had to do with an improvement to the Ruby programming language, whereby you could use the old format or you could go to the new format, which would be simpler to read. But it was decided that this was not a format that we needed in the application. The problem is that it had been done relatively early in the PR, it was going to be very difficult to undo this particular change. So I played around with a prompt generation technique and you can see eight files that have been changed here and in one of the files, there's a bunch of changes that have been made, essentially undoing the stylistic change that was done using a linter. For years, I've been experimenting with domain-specific languages designed to generate code and other sorts of constructs. The ability to become a polyglot programmer where you start from a design pattern or first principles and generate any sort of code is the goal that I've had. Now, rather than doing a no-code platform, I've always thought of it as a flow code platform where you're generating a freaking lot of code. Now, the way I see it working is some sort of domain-specific language that you integrate with the AI pair programmer that you like to use. So let's have a look at how this could work. So I've got a little clueless construct called git diff. And the idea of it is that you should be able to do a comparison between, say, the master branch and another PR. And from there, you should be able to process the changes. Let's see them in both JSON and maybe flattened out into a CSV format. Now, we have the construct here ready to save and we've got two files that it's going to output to. So if we let that run, what should happen is we'll get a list of JSON structure where all the diffs and the particular files. So here's a gem file and there's a bunch of diffs going on in there. Now over on the right where you see the CSV file, it's just a flattened version of it. Now if we make the CSV file easier to see, you can see it's basically a bunch of files. We've got the number of changes or diffs that are in it, plus we can see the diffs. So if we look at the gem file here, we can see that there are eight different changes going on in that particular file. At the moment, we don't have any matches because what we try to do is figure out what sort of changes are going in there and then make appropriate changes based on the match type. So the next step is to categorize all these files. And you can see that there's over 2000 files and changes going on here. And if we go to the very top, you'll see that none of them have been processed and the match type has not been filled in. Now, if we look at what it will look like, the idea is that they have all been processed. Some of them don't match on anything. Others match on gem version investigate. Others match on hash shorthand syntax. And it's the hash shorthand syntax that I want to generate new code for. So let's have a look at how this clueless construct could work. So here I've got an idea called prompt matcher. And what it's going to do is take an input file. In this case, it's going to be the diff CSV. From there, we want to find a pattern. So the pattern, I'm going to call it issues. And I've just started writing it, analyze the following diff and identify the pattern below. So I've listed what the old and the new code should look like. And then I've said, if it finds it, return hash 
shorthand syntax. After that, if it's not found, return no match. And I want to make sure that it doesn't try to return any other sorts of information. From there, just insert the actual content that you want it to compare from. The other thing I do is I put some constraints in it as to what the default value is if it can't figure anything out and what the expected values happen to be. After that, we find the matches and update the diffs.csv. Now at the moment it deals with one pattern, but if you want it to deal with a second pattern, you can expand the prompt and you just change things to suit what you need. Now if we look at the differences between these two prompts, we've got a little bit change in the wording. We've got the example of a second pattern going on and we've just got extra information going on in the expected results so that they can be validated. So let's work with this version and what we'll do is we'll also print out a report and when we look at that we can see this report has come through. It's got the different match types including no match and then it's got a column of how many are for each type. So if we look at the gem version investigate it found five in the gem file, it found seven in the gem file lock. And then we've got a scattering of hash syntax shorthand matches throughout all the other files. Now if we look at how many changes could happen. We've got this column B which has the things that we want to change and we look through and there's hundreds of files. If we get down to the very bottom of this we can see there are 940 potential files. Not all of them are selected. This is a lot of changes that are going to go on. So we now need to wrap this up and bundle it into specific prompts that we can use in Cursor. So now what we're going to do is build out the prompts for Cursor to work with. So we're at the generate prompts and I've put in our diff file as input. It's now been updated with matches. From there, we want to filter the items. Now, there's particular items that we want in the list. So what we'll do is where the pattern match is true and we've got a match type equal to the hash shorthand syntax. From there, we'll do a header to the prompt. So all the prompts will start with something like this. This is just explaining the pattern for ChatGPT to go and update, or in this case, cursor. From there, we'll iterate over every item Item and we'll just include the content from the particular item we've got. And then lastly, put in a bit of a footer to close it off. The other thing that's important is that when we're creating the files, we do batch them up because I don't want cursor to make all the changes in one hit. I want to look at them, say, 20 files at a time. So what I've done here is set filtered items. In this case, it's batch size 15. I want them all to go out to a particular folder and have a TXT extension. So we're about to look at the prompts. Before we do, we'll just start back from the beginning. What we firstly generated was a JSON structure from a diff between two different branches. From that, we then turned it into a CSV file and we've matched different things. You can see the report going on there. Then lastly, it's created the prompts and the prompts that it's created number 65 different prompts that I need to run. But that's all dealing with about 15 changes per prompt. And if we look at the first one, we can see that we got the header section and then we've got the actual code that needs to be looked at and analyzed and that just keeps repeating. And right at the bottom, there should be a closure for it as well. Now let's head over to cursor and you can see here we've got the reverse Ruby shorthand syntax. Let's click on that and we can see the main part of the prompt and there's a lot of changes going in here, different files, but they're cherry picked to the specific changes and then we can see them all come through here. I went and applied each of these changes. Now we'll go and have a look at the files that have changed on the PR at the moment. If we open up the assets controller, we can see the changes have come through and they're accurate. Look at the activities controller, we've got similar sorts of things going on and all of this has just been cherry picked out of the prompts and just run on automation with cursor. So let's actually test another one with cursor. So I've come over to the list of prompts and I'm just going with the second one at the moment and here we are at cursor. I'll press command L to bring up a chat and I'm just going to paste everything in and let's run it and see what happens. So certainly here's the necessary fixes. We've got the next file, company targets, controller, homepage, dashboard, location updatable. And if we go to the bottom, it says these changes reverse the shorthand hash syntax. So from here, I'm just going to press apply on this particular change. From there, we'll go with command Y, command Y again. Let's just check there's nothing else going on in here. 
we can then press apply on this one and look through to where the actual change happens to be. And you can see these little blue lines is where you look for the change. Just scroll all the way down to the next one and press Y on that. So now we've gone from the eight that we originally had to now 15 files and we can look through and see how the changes were. And we're looking at the email controller and we can see some changes at around line 370 and more at around line 700. So I was able to use Cursor AI to take this PR with 950 file changes. There's 2200 diffs and recreate a new PR with over a thousand changes in it 412 files and this was all with the power of simple automation scripts and cursor AI now contrary to that last statement not everything was fun and I took a bunch of notes along the way of what happens so there's this idea of pressing command Y on the Mac which will apply the changes automatically for you one at a time and it's a great tool I was using it all the time but you can't do it until all the changes have been processed in the file so if you've got many changes say 20 you might be waiting around for 20 or 30 seconds before you can even start now if you want to do a bulk setup one of the things I noticed is that as you're pressing apply on each of these you're getting the changes over here you can press command Y or command N if you don't want to accept the change but once they're all in place you can press the accept now you'll see soon that I didn't use this feature because I kept finding little edge cases where things didn't work and I had to manually check every line as I went. I sometimes found the speed at which I could get stuff done here being impaired through the way it was communicating messages. There were inconsistencies with the colors that would show up on the bar. There were inconsistencies with the messaging and I'd be sitting here waiting going, has it finished yet or not? So sometimes things just took longer than I think they should have. That also led into issues with using the mouse and the command Y together if you press page down and your cursor goes below an area that's changed and then you press command Y it would actually do the next area so there was a little bit of challenges just getting used to how that interface works but the big problems happen to be with code not working the way you would think so here we had a change and it actually changed a variable name from an at to not an at so this was something that I wasn't able to accept. Then it was making some legitimate changes, but they weren't in keeping with the prompt. Or worse still, it would just create an actual bug by taking something out that was meant to be there. Once I was getting into the groove of working with 15 changes at a time, that's how the prompts were set up, I decided to increase it to 100. And at that point, things just stopped working. And the way it communicated just didn't really give me an idea of what was going on. So it might just make one file change. So I had to go back to smaller prompts, which is fair enough with large language models, but it was something I learned. And if we come down to five, six, and seven, these are pretty much similar to the ones before where it's gone and made these odd changes that would only introduce bugs into the system. So same with number eight. If you want access to the code that I used to generate the diffs and the prompts, check out the link in the description. I'll also put a link to the clueless coding language ideas that I'm working through at the moment. In the next video, I plan to use V0 to create a video asset management tool to communicate with a video editor. So stay tuned for that. I'm Happy Dave. Please like and subscribe. See you soon.